and it's a real pleasure. My name's Paul Gravette, and I'm, uh, I'm, this is my first, well, my second time at SBX, the first time at this really uh, amazing venue, and I'm from London, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to, have, to talk to you about two very important new comics that you've produced, Bill. Mm -hmm. And we're starting off with uh, your biography, the new biography of Ernie Bushmiller, which has come out from Abrams. It's called Three Rocks, hence the images here. Yes. So um, I was wondering what yeah. this is. I should just add, by the way, that you may not be fully aware that Bill is a graphic novelist as well as doing, of course, the Zippy, the Pinhead Daily Strip in your daily paper, which is a lovely link, of course, between Bill and Ernie Bushmiller, because but Bushmiller, of course, was also a Daily Strip cartoonist. Uh, and, and and I should just add, sorry, that, that just some context, that you also ought to be aware that Bill is now, in my opinion, really at the top of your game, because you're not only doing the strips, the zippy, uh, but you're also doing uh, graphic novels, I mean, substantial, yeah, major um, works. I'm Remarkable. A late, I'm a late-life graphic novelist, yes. Um, yeah. It's they were, the, the first one, uh, Invisible Ink, about my mother's 16-year secret love affair with a then-famous cartoonist, no longer famous, so the name does, the name does not resonate to most people now. Um, that was percolating in the back of my brain from sometime in the 70s. I did a one-page strip kind of touching on it and made sure I changed everybody's name because my mother was still alive at that point. But once she died and left me all the information I needed to make Invisible Ink into a book, she left me her journals, her diaries, her 384-page unpublished family saga in which all of the characters' names were changed, but all of the characters were obvious to me who they were. Um, so she was basically telling me, okay, get to work. So this, as you say, this is a, kind of a secret family story, but it certainly, but she left a lot of evidence, shall we say, and material. Do you yeah. think, did, did she imagine uh, you might be developing into a graphic novel? Do you have any idea she might have thought well, that, that would happen? Wh when, when my father died, he died in an accident in 1972. So I was 28. Um, in the waiting room in the hospital, when the, when the doctor came to tell us that my father had died, we all, my sister and I, you know, we wept and we were distraught and we collected ourselves together and the doctor w left. And my mother came to us, my sister and myself, and she said, I have to tell you something now because I'll never be able to do it again later. I had a wonderful romance with a man you knew for 16 years, and I want you to know that I did that. M my response was, really? Uh, <laughs> uh, my father just died. <laughs> yeah, is this so the moment? Is I this really the moment? The, yeah, yes. I didn't ask her a single question. Hmm. I don't think she wanted me to. Hmm. But then when, when she died, she left me this treasure trove of all this material. Hmm. She was a writer. She also left me a 10-page confession about the affair. So she wanted me to do something. Graphic novels were not a thing to her. No. Um, she liked Zippy. She had a Zippy tattoo on her shoulder. Hey, <laughs> now that's a real mom okay. that does that. When, when your 70-something mother comes to you and says, I, I want a tattoo of your cartoon character on my body. So you then become the parent and you say, you want what? <laughs> <laughs> when I realized she was serious, I said, oh God, okay. I have to design this tattoo and you have to give it to the tattoo artist. I'm not going to have to look at a bad zippy drawing on the back of your shoulder for the rest of your life. Was, it, was this her first tattoo? It was her first and only tattoo. Oh, my. She got it in a place where she would only show it to people when she was in her bathing suit, uh -huh. which she did. I had a hot tub in my backyard. She came over to be in the hot tub. And this is in San Francisco. And um, so it was something that people saw, but only when she wanted them to. But yeah, so Impressive. that's my mother. My mother was a one of a kind, yes. <laughs> so getting, we're, we're getting off the subject. No, no, but it's all, it all relates. I mean, but, uh, because it's, this is the world of, of graphic novels, also the world of, of, of the newspaper strip, and then we come to Bushmiller with uh, the most, one of the most iconic newspaper strips. I mean, to the point where it's used in the dictionary to 
to define a comic strip is that it's illustrated next to the to the word. And, and, it's, and it's, there's a famous phrase by Wally Wood, isn't there? Where, and which is which is the you you read with you read the Nancy before you realize that you don't want to read it, or more accurately, that it's so instantly readable visually right. that you read it without. He said it's almost harder to not read Nancy it. than to read Nancy. Exactly. In other words, the minute it's presented to you, you're, you're already you're into it. You're reading it. Yeah, it goes which I completely agree. It's so iconic. It's now, so wasn't it powerful. said by, by Wood as a, as a compliment? I don't think perhaps. Or was it? Do you think he was complimenting? I think, you know, I think he meant it as a compliment. Good, I, yeah. I don't think he was a big Nancy fan, but yeah, I think he meant it as a, he yeah. was a pretty um, smart guy. So yeah, yeah, I think he meant it as a compliment. You got it. Um, the the catchphrase that I used to introduce the book is "Peanuts" is a strip uh, that tells you what it's like to be a child. Nancy tells you what it's like to be a comic strip. <laughs> that is really breaking it down to its most essential form. Mm -hmm. Of course, that knowledge that it's telling you what a comic strip is like um, is received differently. But by cartoonists, it's received very directly because we see how he structured his comics. He thought of his punchline first. He worked yeah. backwards. He imagined a funny situation, mm -hmm. usually a sight gag, almost always a sight gag. Mm -hmm. Then he would say, okay, in four panels, how do I get to the gag? And then he'd work backwards to get, to get you to the gag. So, um, you know, Nancy... Um, uh, we could show a slide, please. I'm sorry. Can we have a slide up on the... On the should we just do that? Yeah, we can have a cover up here. Yeah. Oh, you want to... Yeah. Well, we're not, we're not going... Slides don't necessarily relate to... No, no, we'll have, anyway. we'll have them on. Yeah, yeah so, um, but, you know, the average reader, uh, they may not um, appreciate or care much about the fact that Nancy tells you what it's like to be a comic strip, but they're mm -hmm. receiving it in the same way. It's so powerful that it draws you in like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Bushmiller... Um, well, he also worked in an unusual way, Bill, didn't he? Because in, you explained that he would have the, the last panels ready, but then he'd have four strips on the go at the same time in his he, studio. He, he created four Nancy extraordinary strips. Extraordinary system. In his studio in mm -hmm. Connecticut, he had four drawing tables <laughs> and a chair in front of each one, and he would work on four strips at once in rotation. He would do the first panel of the first strip, the first panel of the second strip, like that, and keep... He'd already have the sight gag last panel yeah. in his head somewhere. Yeah. But his, his work method was, you know, whatever works. Um, I don't work that way. I work kind of the opposite. I sit down to do a zippy strip and I kind of depend on a voice inside my head to tell me what to do. And, and you, don't, you don't have a, 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 a fourth panel in mind or a punchline in mind when you start. I, I don't know where it's going to go. You don't know where it's going to no. go. No. I know. I know what the first panel is going to be. Yeah. And then it's a question of doing a lot of penciling and editing to get to the finished product. And there because I, I don't know the, the finished product. And there are, I mean, there are ask it other points where you you got to the end of a, a stripping out. This isn't the right ending, or do you? Yes. Are you, yes. Because when I finish a strip, <laughs> yeah. before I, well. When I finish penciling a zippy strip, yeah, yeah. I, I do something that Ernie did too. I hold it a little bit away from myself oh, so I can yes. get a slightly outsider view of it. And I mentally, or sometimes orally, actually read it. And then I know if there's something that needs to be removed or changed is in terms yeah, of is, language. Is there some catnip? Is there yeah, the catnip? Er, well, Ernie would hold his strip yeah. when he finished it um, before it was inked. And he would say to himself, is there enough catnip in here? Is it funny phrase. Can yeah. I make Then when he finished a week's worth, he would put them on the wall over his drawing table and he would look at them to try to figure out, can I lose some of the words here? Are there too many words? You've already got a real bare bones kind of writing style to begin with, mm -hmm. but he needed to, to make it absolutely perfect. Um, the I, most immediate possible, really. No, I, I had yeah, experience yeah. with um, trying to get a zippy animated a TV show going in around the year 2000. Mm. And one of the writers I worked with was a Seinfeld writer. <clears throat> and he said, when he read our initial, we had six scripts, and when he read them, his first job, he said, was to deal with the pacing of the language. Something is funny 
or not funny, sometimes just based on the amount of syllables that are spoken. Now this is more true for a sitcom or a play or a movie than it is for a comic strip, but it also applies for, for a comic strip. Mm -hmm. There's a structure at, that the reader is unaware of, but that the creator of the strip needs to be very aware of. So um, how many syllables lead up to the punchline, how many syllables the punchline is, that's, that's actually a pretty crucial step. It's almost like a haiku or something, isn't it? Just like a haiku. Yes. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. That's true. Could we have the next image just so that people can see some of what it's like inside? Here we go. Yeah, so... Um, because we, we should mention here how this is, you've done a very original approach to this graphic novel in many ways, in several respects. But one is that you are incorporating Bushmiller's own drawings. Uh, and not, in other words, you didn't decide to e ever to redraw Nancy or something. No, I never redraw anything. Yeah. Um, how do you, in my how previous did you work strips, on that? I, yeah. I redrew a lot. Yeah. Um, no, I got permission from the copyright holder, Andrews mm -hmm. McMeal. Uh, who inherited United Feature, which is the syndicate that Ernie worked for. I got permission to use Nancy in any form, including to change dialogue. Um, but I told them I would never change, I would, whenever I used Nancy in this book, mm. it was collaged. So I would cut out a Nancy, I cut out a Sluggo, and paste them into the panels. Mm. And whatever I wanted to do with them after that was my own writing. The purpose of that was to, to create transitional pages throughout the book. So instead of saying chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, as each chapter ends and the next chapter begins, you come to a page in the book with a black bleed all the way around. And Nancy and Sluggo, in effect, are leading you from the previous chapter to the next chapter. So in that, in that case, all of their dialogue is written by me. But all of the artwork is Ernie's. So. I was totally shocked that Andrews McMeal said yes when they, I told them what I was doing. Yeah. Maybe they didn't understand what I, I meant. <laughs> so I, I may still get a letter. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so um, Nancy is used. Also, I thought there's going to be some people who read this that mm. actually haven't seen too many Nancy strips. True. So there are a couple of sections in the book where it's strategically placed, mm -hmm. where you see a bunch of actual Nancy strips. Yeah. That had a very interesting um, evolution. While I was doing this book, I was always going on to eBay to look for Nancy stuff. One day I'm looking for Nancy stuff and it says, uh, Nancy scrapbook, $50, buy it now. Whoa. Okay, so I w sight unseen. I mean, scrapbooks are an incredible uh, resource, aren't they? I figured it was somebody individual. clipped out Nancy strips. Yeah, yeah. And it was about 1963. This came in the mail two days later. This was a major revelation. Mm. I realized that the heyday, the best decade for Nancy was actually the 1960s, not the 40s that everybody says. It's the 60s. It's my opinion, <laughs> but I back it up in the book. Mm. This person who collected these strips and pasted them into the book put them not in the consecutive order in which they appeared, but in an order that made sense to the person that was doing it. And they, they actually read like a 40-page like a graphic novel. Mm. Absolutely amazing stuff. Mm. And whoever did it was incredibly anal retentive, neat. You mm. know, there's no buckling of mm. paper. It's on you know, scrapbook paper, but it's in mm. pristine condition. Um, so you know, this was, I, had to, I had to put this in the book. And it, re, it, it changed your, your, your view of Bushmiller's uh, when, when he achieved his peak, his, 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 his pinnacle of yeah, I mean, synthesis it, it, of the language. Yeah. It's an artificial thing. Yeah. A cartoonist doesn't have just one peak. No, <laughs> no. They have series of peaks. Yeah. In fact, they have peaks that happen within one year. Mm. Uh, uh, the daily comic strip um, does not require that you produce the very best of your work every day. It just requires that you keep doing it. So. Hmm. When you look at Nancy anthologies, like the ones that Fanographics published, for instance, hmm. if you read them consecutively, you will feel this kind of uh, peaks and valleys. You know, there'll be some strips that you think they actually are kind of, they don't, they they're kind of half dead. They're, they don't work. Not much catnip. Then. Yeah, not yeah. much catnip. And then you come to a whole section where it's on. He's at his absolute peak best. So, this is the the nature of a daily comic strip. It, it's 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 a. It's a beast, it's, a, it's an entity, and it has good days and bad days.
And it's, of course, it's absolutely appropriate that you, not only are you a graphic novelist, you're a daily strip artist, so you have that deep, deep connection of having to make a strip uh, continuously uh, con uh, appear with Zippy. And yeah, so I mean, you, I, you, you don't understand what he's gone through. You've never tried... Uh, see, that, that, that the technique is, is demanding on an artist so much, isn't it? It's, it, oh, it takes over your life, I Yeah, well, imagine. newspaper cartoonists, um, there's no vacations built into it. No. Um, so you have to double up. On st I had to double up on strips to come here. And I'm kind of amazed you can find time to, to, to keep doing Zippy and then well, find time to take on these mammoth graphic novel projects. I, I work every goddamn day. Yeah, I know you have a fantastic... <laughs> that's an admirable work ethic. I, I am at my happiest when I'm at my drawing table. Well, this, that explains it's not, it. It's yeah. not a burden to me. It's the opposite. If my life is not going well, especially when my wife was ill, yeah. um, this was my refuge. Yeah. To sit at the drawing table and be in touch with whatever this thing inside me is that makes comic strips. Mm. So, yeah. So as, as you're researching Bushmuller's uh, career, what kind of other material, you mentioned the scrap, but were there other breakthrough new sources of information well, that there was added to... one huge breakthrough. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me give credit... Can we have the next credit. slide, by the way? Sorry, I hope I just interrupt you. Yeah. Can we get another image up? Yeah, thank you. Let me give credit where credit oh, yeah, is we'll due. Be, and the next one, maybe. Yeah. There were two books before me. In 1988, yeah. in 1988, The Best of Nancy, put together by Brian Walker, Mort Walker's son, okay? That came out in 1988. Whenever, after that came out, whenever people would say to me, gee, you know, um, what's so good about Nancy? I, I think it's kind of a dumb strip. I would say, okay, here, read this book. This truly is the best of Nancy. He left out all the dumb strips, all the, <laughs> all the strips that you could call dumb. All the, just, the valleys, I guess just, you would he, say. He, yeah, he put yeah. in all the peaks. Yes. So, yes. Then, in 2017, Mark Newgarden and Paul Karasik came out with How to Read Nancy, yeah. which they admit is somewhat tongue-in-cheek. This, like, how many pages? 100 pages yes. of breaking down one strip into every single element, almost down to the atomic level. <laughs> Um, you know, which is, it's, it's academic, it's esoteric, absurd, it's fun, it's tedious, it's all kinds of things. But in that book, they did a certain amount of research and, and interviews, and they produced a fairly decent biography for the first time mm. of Ernie. Mm. So I was given, in effect, all of their research. Mark and Paul gave me all the raw interviews they did. Ah, right for many of whom the interviewees were now dead, were yeah. gone. Mm. Ernie had a bunch of assistants that he worked with, all of whom are gone. Al Pastino is So I had access to me. all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the best of all was Ernie's, I, I would call, I would say he's a neighbor, but he didn't live right next door. He lived very close. Mm. He was an, a man na named um, Jim Carlson. So Jim Carlson, as a college student, was going around the neighborhood in Stamford, Connecticut, where Ernie lived, selling eggs. His father had a landscaping business and sold eggs on the side. So he knocked on the door and he was introduced to the Bushmiller clan. Um, Abby, Ernie's wife, thought he was a kind of a interesting kid and um, he wound up having a beer with Ernie and they became friends. That a while to become what really happened much later, which was when Ernie began to get, uh, he had Parkinson's, and at the beginning it was no big deal, but of course Parkinson's tends to progress. Um, so the last 12 years of his life, uh, Jim Carlson became his, his everything, his right-hand man. Mm -hmm. When I asked Jim how he would like me to describe him mm. to on an audience like this, I thought he would say assistant or uh, um, right-hand man. He said, best friend. <laughs> yeah. okay. And he gave me all the evidence that that was true. So he became Ernie's best friend. And he gave me extensive interviews. I remember at one point I thought I would find out stuff about Ernie by saying, um, for instance, um, what was his favorite music? Did he listen to music? And Jim said, Fats Waller my brain semi-exploded at that point. <laughs> I would have thought he would say Lawrence Welk, you know? Yeah. He said Fats Waller. Wow. 
I said, who is his favorite, favorite humorist? S.J. Perelman. Who is his favorite artist? Diego Velasquez. Whoa. That really got me going. Wow. <laughs> Diego Velasquez, I, I still, I can get why anybody would like Fat Swaller or S.J. Perelman or Jackie Gleason, these people he loved. Hmm. Why he liked Diego Velasquez, I, maybe if you have an idea, let me know <laughs> what it is. <laughs> this is the man who painted the Pope, you know, um, yeah. who did r paintings of, of uh, the Spanish royalty. Um, you know, nice stuff, but why he liked it, I, I, but there it is. All these things form a person, you know. Mm. If someone wants to know who you are, if they, you give them, you know, the 10 things you like the most in the world, that will tell a lot about you, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody was really privy to that information since they were all gone, um, except Jim Carlson. And without him, this book couldn't have happened. No, that's remarkable yeah. that you connected with him. Yep. I'm puzzled about uh, Ernie and Abby Bushmiller. Um, there's no reason, of course, why any married couple or unmarried couple, whatever, needs to, would have necessarily children, but they didn't have children. Yeah. And do we, is that, is, that seems to me to be something that's a little bit... I, I couldn't uncover um, the reason. No, I wondered if you'd have. Yeah, if there was yeah. a, um, you know, if there was just a, a reason in the sense mm. that they just didn't like children, <laughs> you know. Um, mm. Her, uh, let me see, Ernie's, Ernie's niece said that Nancy was, Nancy was Abby and Ernie's child. That was, just, that was all they needed. They didn't need a real child. Whatever, mm. um, but they, you know, there's never any indica indication from Ernie or Abby about about uh, any background of where they did they were childless. Yeah, or the, what they felt about unfortunately, that? No. Uh, Jim Carlson didn't have that information for me. Because um, I get the feeling when uh, as you whether you portray Jim Carlson yeah. is that he became a sort of obviously he's an adult, but he was still a kind of son father. He, he was a relation. bit of a recluse. Um, yeah. Uh, so Ernie Bushmiller lived in Stamford, Connecticut, after he spent the earlier part of his life in different apartments in the Bronx where he was born. Um, so once he once he was well off, um, he he bought a home in Stamford, Connecticut, within ten or fifteen miles of him were dozens of other cartoonists. They all flocked to that area. His closest cartooning neighbor was Alex Raymond. <laughs> um, he, he knew Mort Walker, he knew all of them. There were a lot of cartoonists around that area, weren't it, there, There I were think. just dozens yeah, yeah, of them. Yeah, cartoonists, yeah. illustrators, mad magazine writers. Mm -hmm. It was 48 minutes to Manhattan from St the tra Stanford train station. It was the 1940s. The, the houses and the property were not particularly expensive. Um, so it just happened. This became cartoon central. They all played golf, except Ernie. <laughs> Ernie did not play golf. You can make whatever conclusion you want to make about <laughs> that. Um, um, but what he did was, <laughs> instead of playing golf, he cut a 12 foot wide swath into the woods behind his house about 150 feet deep, and smashed golf balls into the void. Well, so you could say he did play golf, but he played golf. A unique kind of he golf. He played golf, but only <laughs> as the punchline to a Nancy strip. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. I mean, the other early years, as you mentioned, because because he was living and uh, working in the, the big bullpen of the newspaper strip cartoon world. That's an extraordinary moment for American. Mm -hmm cartooning, isn't it? Uh, and he was brought yeah. onto the Fritzy Ritz strip, which, which miraculous, I mean, at a very young age, he was suddenly given the chance to fill in or take over, in fact, from, <clears throat> from a, 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 yeah, a Ernie, successful strip. Ernie dropped out of, yeah. of school, out of, out of technically, I guess, junior high school at, at, the, at the eighth grade. His parents were perfectly happy, as many parents were at that time, to have their children drop out of school and go get a job <clears throat> and bring money into the family. <clears throat> so Ernie dropped out of school, and he thought there were two jobs he might try. One was to work for the Cunard shipping line, to be like a, a janitor, I don't know what, on you know the Queen Elizabeth, some big ship. He tried that, they said, no, we don't need anybody. Then his second choice was to go to the New York World newspaper, downtown Manhattan, and apply for a job as a copy boy. And they said, welcome, here's your $9 a week which he had to give to his mother and father, almost all of them, okay? 
So he did this for a number of years when he would take stuff from copy boys, what they did in those days was a writer, a journalist, would do something and they would yell copy. When they yelled copy, a copy boy, they were all boys, teenage boys or younger, they would come to the person who yelled copy and grab whatever they had and take it to wherever the guy told them, to an editor, to somewhere. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that would be, somebody would yell copy and then it would have to go to the bullpen. The bullpen in uh, daily newspaper lingo of those days was where all the, art, was the art department. So all the cartoonists, all the illustrators, they all were in this one big space. And they all had drawing tables right next to each other. So Ernie would take stuff into the bullpen and he would immediately become transfixed by the cartoonists doing comics. He started, you know, ignoring his job a little bit. Um, he started asking questions. At one point, I have a, a story in my book where he starts trying to figure out what it is that makes you know, a daily cartoonist work and the cartoonist who's completely uh, obscure, nothing, nobody famous, says, is that what you want to do, boy? You want to be a cartoonist? And Ernie says, yes, yes. And he says, well, then you have to learn the basics. And Ernie said, you mean um, uh, penciling and uh, lettering and inking? And the guy says, no, erasing. <laughs> that is and he handed him an art gum eraser. And he said, see the strip I just finished? Before that goes to the compositor, where it would be turned into a metal plate to be printed by the newspaper. Before it gets there, the pencil has to be erased so it doesn't pick up, so you don't see it. So for um, at least a year or two, he was erasing. But can you imagine uh, you know, a 14-year-old, 15-year-old boy who wanted to be a cartoonist being handed every day dozens of original comic art to erase? That must be the best comic was like course falling. any any cartoonist what this was like, could get. This was yeah. like an education yeah. on steroids for yeah. him. You know? Amazing. Um, when I teach comics, which I do at the School of Visual Arts, I try to do the same thing. I figure the best way kids can learn about comics is to be presented with as much original art as possible. Mm -hmm. My art, people that I have collections of, Nancy Pages, everything. Just And I, all I tell them to, to do is look. I'm not going to talk much about it. Just look. Hmm. Just, just absorb. You know. So he went from that to, at the age of 19, um, there was a, a strip called Fritzy Ritz. She was a flapper. She was a bit dated. She seemed to be taking place a little earlier. Um, she began in the 20s or in the 20s. Uh, yes, yeah. right, right. Uh, teens and 20s. Hmm. Um, then by a, a, a cartoonist named Larry Whittington. So. In 1925, King Features, my syndicate, <laughs> approached Larry Whittington um, to do Fritzy, and they said, w we would like to have you leave the New York world and come to us, and we will syndicate Fritzy to, across the country. So this was his, his dream. Mm -hmm. He said yes. Then he told his editor what he was going to do, and the editor said, oh my god, we can't lose Fritzy Ritz. It's this incredibly popular strip. So who shall we get to continue? And Whittington says, well, I've been talking to this kid, um, Bushmiller, and kind of teaching him a little bit about Fritzy. You might want to check him out. So at the age of 19, Ernie Bushmiller inherited the Fritzy Ritz daily comic strip. That's pretty special. He, he um, <laughs> immediately started to alter Fritzy a little bit to look somewhat like his wife. Oh. Um, but he kept the storylines. Fritzy was a um, Fritzy was an independent woman. She had no family, no husband, a series of boyfriends, all of which she dumped in the storylines that were that were part of the strip. She um, she was you know there, there was a, a sexual quality. She was cute, you know. She wore. Um, uh, you know, the clothes, the current styles of the day. Um, most of the stories took place in, they traveled, they went to LA, she tried to break into the movies, um, all of which, after a while, became a little stale for him. Hmm. And he was talking to Abby, his wife, and they both thought, maybe we should introduce a kid into the strip, because it would kind of shift gears. And I the kid, could, the, the kid I, I could cause trouble right. for Fritzy. She's, a, the, 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 she's the, the, a single woman yeah. with a, a 
kind of a career oriented goal mm -hmm. and she's very attractive and she's very um, she, she uses men to get what she wants what if a, a little kid came in what would happen I mean, it's a slightly inappropriate kind of yeah. setting for a kid and so, I, guess, I, mean, I guess also kid strips I mean you would had obviously little Annie Rooney you'd have you had little orphan Annie all of those were right. there was a kid strip genre so this, wasn't this, there? Yeah, this yeah. was not a kid strip no no so he thought okay um, I will do it and he did one strip it's in the book in 1933 um, in which uh, Nancy just appears as a, a mischief maker. It's not there, but anyway, yeah. Mm. Um, um, she, she, is, she says something naughty to distract uh, Fritzie Ritz's current boyfriend. They're like making out on the couch, and Nancy says something, a wise guy remark. The immediate reaction to that was, we want to see more Nancy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they didn't have the kind of demographic analysis that we have today, but editors very routinely would do polls and they would say, what's your favorite strip and why is it your favorite strip? Mm -hmm. And suddenly everybody wanted to have more of Nancy. She was, she was impish, she was, she was naughty, <laughs> and she was in a world, the Fritz and Ritz world, that needed that. Yeah. So, you know, it was only a matter of years until Nancy completely took over the strip. Now, there has to be something said about Fritzy Ritz, which I, I have a whole chapter on, Fritzy, mm. in the book. Um, Fritzy, um, in, the, in the Nancy world, Fritzy is, is Nancy's aunt, okay? All comics did that, in, including uh, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse. That way, you, you weren't, you didn't have to picture that character having sex because <laughs> they were not parental, okay? So Frissy was Ernie's, was, was, uh, was Nessie's aunt, but she had come from a previous strip and that was, she wasn't altered in the way she looked. So to me, this was like um, two strips colliding mm. in this Bushmiller world and I, it added yet another layer of surreal strangeness that I think was absolutely wonderful. He was, uh, Ernie was actually told, um, you know, he kind of wanted to fade out Ritz, Fritzy, but mm, his, his mm. managing editor said, no, Fritzy is sex and Nancy is fun. You can't eliminate one of them because when you have a sexy character, you know, this is all in the context of the time when I'm saying this. You, you're, okay, when I was trying to make a Zippy movie, <laughs> um, we had, we had a, a, a relationship with Brandon Tartikoff. Brandon Tartikoff of NBC Pictures. Brandon Tartikoff brought Seinfeld to NBC, okay. Brandon Tartikoff was given um, the, the power to make independent movies in, when was it? Uh, late 80s. So he, he asked for a meeting and we talked to him. And I, in, in that meeting, I said, can you tell me why Seinfeld was so popular? Because to me, it was about four people who live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Why are they popular with people that live in Arkansas? And he said, because it skews bimodally. So it appeals to two opposing groups at the same time. He said the most obvious example of that is all in the family. Bigots loved Archie Bunker mm -hmm. because he was a fellow bigot. Liberals loved him because he was making, they were, he was making fun of bigots. Mm -hmm. So if you have both audiences, you have a, a success formula. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a little bit of that was going on with Nancy. There was to, to, to divorce Fritzy from Nancy would, would have eliminated this, this bimodal, bimodal skewing reality. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, um, Fritzy was, I mean, she was kind of cruel, <laughs> which was kind of interesting that she would be cruel. Um, but she always, but Nancy always kind of won out. 
mm -hmm. when, when there was a conflict. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, Sluggo was an orphan. Sluggo had no parents. Um, so and again, um, without parents, there's no sex. Anyway, so Fritzy and Nancy, they were joined at the hip and I'm glad that happened. It's, it went up until 1966 because <laughs> Ernie always wanted to get rid of her mm, and he mm. finally did in 1966. That, that was the last Fritzy appearance. And initi I mean, initially, Nancy's early appearances were, were not, not really anything so close to how we get to know the character later. And there was a, quite an evolution of how Bushmiller drew Nancy. So the first appearance seemed, appearances seemed to kind of blend in uh, slightly more with the style of a, Fritzy. Well, there it is. There's, yeah. There's a page of, yeah. the, you can see the, the very first Nancy appearance on the top left. Mm. And then you can see how he changed her. Mm-hmm. This was not a conscious thing. This just happened. If you look at my zippy strips um, from the underground days, mm -hmm. and then you look at the zippy strip that appears in today's paper, mm -hmm. they're, they don't look exact. They're, they're similar, mm -hmm. but there's an evolution that happens. And it just happens naturally. I don't know how many of you people are cartoonists, but I know when you draw something over and over again, the same character every day, it's going, there's gonna be some changes. Usually for the good, improvements. Mm -hmm. When I first started drawing myself, the Griffey character in Zippy Strips, mm -hmm. don't ask me why, but I made my hair yes. stand up straight like 12 inches high. <laughs> I don't I even assumed know you why I like did that. that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was 1992, um, I have Griffey in front of a mirror with a comb and he's saying, I can't control my life, I can't control the world, but I can control my hair. <laughs> And he combs his hair back. And then from then on, his hair was not going straight up like that. Okay. Why? I don't know. You kind of cartoonified yourself for the, for the, yeah. for the comics. So Nancy yeah, yeah. changed. Um, mm. She became more geometric, you know, more. Ernie used a, a compass. He used a ruler. He, he would not freehand um, certain things if they look better with a compass. And he was very precise, yeah, wasn't he, so, as well? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned something about 63 little spikes is the well, required he, number of he, on her hair. He counted I mean, all, how many spikes in her hair at, at whatever size the drawing was. And <sighs> okay. when he had assistants towards the end of his life, if they didn't have the correct number of spikes, he would call them in the middle of the night and say, I said 69, not 67. Okay, was 69, was it? Okay, yeah. 69 was okay, what yeah. he said. Right. Um, when I look throughout all the strips, it does vary, but it, it varies according to how large Nancy is being drawn. One would imagine, yeah, that, that would yeah. make some sense, I think, having right. to do it on a microscopic scale, yes. Right, so the yeah. guy that um, did most of his, uh, that his assistant that did the most of his stuff, um, used a fountain pen that he, f that he f sanded down so it had a, a blunt edge. And he, he did the spikes with that tool. Wow. A fountain, uh, he used a fountain pen as a dip pen. He dipped it and then put all the spikes in. And he was very, um, always very nervous. Um, towards the last decade of Ernie's life, he, he had somewhat of a shaky hand from Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. But he micromanaged the strip completely. He wrote every mm -hmm. single one of them. And if anything was the slightest bit off, he would ask for a, a rewrite. So, yeah, we should touch on the on how Nancy, though even despite uh, its success, was often looked down upon, um, and how it's now become re reappropriated by various people. And yourself, of course, as somebody championing it as a masterpiece. Well, There's, there are various interpretations of Nancy, aren't there? Yes, I mean, yeah. I, there are there are different ways to like Nancy, all of which are fine with me. Yeah, um, yeah. There are people that hate Nancy, or at least don't like it. And usually oh, you'd be reason. great. I must just do this, but I, I please don't feel that you can't put your hand up because you're here anyway and appreciating Nancy. Yeah, but maybe there, there are that people that don't like Nancy very much. Is there anybody here that doesn't like Nancy? Don't have to hate her, but don't worry that door. No, yeah. yeah. So this is not putting we, you on the spot. We'd have to very much. We'd have to hire hire some Nancy haters. <laughs> we should. Um, have you ever met? Them I, I've and, come and across Nancy. Nancy. You have well, met them. Yes, I have. Yeah. They usually are people that don't really read comics at all. Oh well. Okay. Yeah, that's very common. Yeah. You know, I, I, most of us probably here, and certainly myself, I grew up reading comics. 
when you think about it, it's kind of a language that you learn as a kid. I've family members of mine um, who don't read comics mm -hmm. tell me it's hard. They never got into it so as children. So looking at a graphic novel is actually a yeah. chore. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it's, it, it, there's no easy access. So yeah. So there are those people. Anyway, mm. there are people who don't like Nancy because they say it's dumb, too simple. Um, it looks like it was done with rubber stamps, which er, that would be a compliment for Ernie, by the way. <laughs> um, so yeah. So what do you say to them? Um, well, you can't convince somebody to like something they don't like. But mm. um, the, the, the other, the people who like Nancy, there's also several variations. One are people who say, yes, it is dumb, but it's, it's, it's brilliantly dumb. In other words, it's sort of kitsch. So I don't, I don't see Nancy as kitsch. Um, I think Nancy is brilliant because it's incredibly smart. Um, I'm just trying to get so we can show some of your slides here, so I'm just yeah, about to um, here, excuse me. Yeah. What I like to say as an analogy about Nancy is, um, okay, um, Charlie Chaplin wants you to like him. Charlie Chaplin movies, the little tramp character, they even go so far as to become sentimental at some times. But Charlie Chaplin wants to entertain you with physical humor, mm -hmm. but he wants you to like him and he wants you to win against the, the Goliath character. Yeah, you side with him, don't you? Very All much. Charlie Chaplin yeah, movies yeah. are David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. And he wants you to cheer him on and like him so much that you want him to win, and he does win, okay? Buster Keaton doesn't care if you like him or not. Buster Keaton just wants to thrilling you, entertain you by things that can only be done with movies. Ernie Bushmiller is Buster Keaton. Mm -hmm. He didn't. He was not interested in making Nancy likable. I don't think Nancy was likable. <laughs> is likable. <laughs> Sluggo is likable. Yeah. Fritzy Ritz is not likable. Um, there, are, there's not much likable stuff going on in um, Bushmiller's um, universe, because he didn't care about that. What he cared about was structuring the gag in such a way that you are entertained. Entertained in a way you didn't expect. That, that's where surrealism enters Nancy Strips. Because sometimes the punchline, the, the sight gag ending, pushes reality. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't take place in the shared reality of, of our world. It takes place in a, a Bushmiller landscape in which he rewrites the rules. Um, I always like the fact that if you look at Nancy strips from 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970, it's, all, it's the same year. There's no acknowledgement of the passage of time whatsoever. Um, Nancy and Sluggo never change the clothes they wear. No, no, they're modernized. The cars it's that go they're... by all look like yeah. they came out of how to draw cars from 1938. <laughs> um, the buildings. The three rocks, the um, horizon line, everything is, is from inside Bushmiller's brain. They're, they don't reflect the real world, um, which tells you something. I mean, um, mm -hmm. the, the opposite of that would be the strip Gasoline Alley by Frank King. Well, yes. Gasoline Alley starts out, and it, it ages chron chronologically throughout the strip. That's so pretty the rare, isn't it? Pretty the rare. The character who's yeah. at the, a baby at the beginning yeah. becomes an adult, and then by the twenty-year period that has gone by, mm -hmm. um, and no, Ernie, Ernie wanted you to enter into Bushmiller land and stay there, and there he would entertain you on his terms. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I think we, I'm, go, I'm just going to catch up with the, with, the, with the wonderful slideshow you put together here, which I, we can discuss as well. This is some of the, the promotional activities that cartoonists got up to. I think we maybe don't appreciate just how much cartoonists were in the public eye 
um, and were they were they sponsored ab, uh, products. They were they were they were celebrities in their era, comic, weren't they? Comic strips. Yeah, and, comic uh, strips. Daily comic strips. Yeah, especially the the twenties and thirties and forties. Um, they yeah, they um, they were yes successful comic strips. The cartoonists were celebrities. I mean, the characters were famous, but so were the people making them. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, people. People still had attention spans back then, <laughs> and and they would follow. There were strips called continuity strips. Continuity yeah. strips meaning that it would actually tell you a story from day to day, and you had to follow it from day to day. Can you imagine that today? That would never never work. That's dying out completely. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Ernie Ernie and Abby actually met at a kind of a cartoonist celebrity party. You know, they and when they started dating, the the, the columnist Walter Winchell actually wrote about them, that they were dating. I, she, I probably had some clever turn of phrase to use that I don't remember. Um, yeah, so they were... Um, they were known, weren't they? they, were, they yeah, they yeah, were. Yeah. They were in the papers. They were in the papers, and yeah. people followed their, their lives as well as their comics. Right, right, right. And the... the uh, you, you actually play with the language of comics as, uh, in, in your graphic novel and your graphic biography, and you also incorporate other intriguing sidelines of material that I, which surprised me. I mustn't give anything away, but there is an extraordinary correspondence between Bushmiller and Samuel Beckett yeah, well, in the book, which I won't say any more about because it's extraordinary and you have to read the book. Yeah, well, we shouldn't say any more. Yeah, well, I shouldn't. No, For those really of you who've read discovery. the book, you know why we can't talk about it. Yes. <laughs> there is a section in the book in which Ernie Bushmiller and the playwright Samuel Beckett uh -huh, carry, yeah, on a, carry on a correspondence. Yes. Yeah. So we'll leave it at that and then read the book and you'll see why I couldn't tell you Anymore. And I also love, I mean, again, I can't give away the, the, the way the book concludes, but there are some beautifully touching moments at the, at the end, and, and you're entering yeah. the, the world, because that must have been tricky to decide, how am I going to conclude the book, how am I going to represent well, the characters when I, living when I on? Came, when I came to yeah. the end of the book, wh mm. which I thought was the end of the book, mm. I felt deflated. I didn't want it to end. Mm. Mm. <laughs> now, there are two reactions you could have from that. One is, to just get used to it and say, well, it, it ended, Bill. You've got to get used to it. It's over. <laughs> the other one is, maybe you feel that way because you, it didn't end. It didn't end yet. Yeah. So that's what that's, I had the second thought. I felt the reason I feel deflated is because it really, it didn't end. What does it need? And then I remembered years ago, I did a strip called Cast of Characters. And this is back in the underground days where I imagine in the future, all of the underground cartoonists that, that were working together in the 70s all wind up in the same retirement home. Mm -hmm. And I go, and I'm also old, and I go visit them and we talk about our, our lives. And at some point, um, they say, have you been behind the retirement home? There are some bungalows back there. And I say, really, what's, what's back there? So I go back. And there's a stream and a little bridge, and I cross the bridge, and there are all these individual bungalows inhabited in real time by all the characters that we've all created. So Zippy is in a little bungalow, Mr. Toad is in a little bungalow, Mr. Natural, all of Robert Crumb's characters, they're all in little bungalows where they're living out their retirement years, but in these little houses. I did a whole strip, and I won't tell you any more than that, but okay. So I thought I did that. So why can't I do that again? So what if I now, in the present, find out that there's a retirement facility run by the comic syndicates somewhere in Stamford, Connecticut, where they all used to live, <laughs> and I could go there and I could talk to Nancy now. She'd be 80-something years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that really... That, that made me happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah but you found an absolutely perfect ending, I can guarantee. So I, yeah, I, I, go yeah. the, uh, yeah, yeah. I go to the retirement home, I pick up the phone, um, and I, I tell Nancy I'd like to speak to her, and she's kind of um, angry, <laughs> she's not happy. Um, she says, Is this, does this mean I'm gonna, I'm gonna misjudge Judy? You know? <laughs> yes. Um, and she's kind of pissed off, but she allows me to talk to her. So the, and the only change I did, I thought a different thing. Ernie himself 
made the uh, versions of Nancy and Sluggo as old people. Yeah, yeah. And wrinkles and all kinds. Of, I Sluggo decided, has a long beard, doesn't he? I think. That, uh, yeah. I decided not to do that. What I would just, okay. what I would do for Nancy was just instead of making her hair solid black, I would make it white. Just, otherwise, she looks the same. She's got those sixty-nine she points. She's a cartoon character, after <laughs> all. She does not have to have wrinkles. Uh, no. That's up to me, right? <laughs> so the, I, I enter this retirement home and I interview Nancy. I take notes. I say, do you mind if I record this? You know, she's, I don't know what the hell, go ahead. You know. And then it, her relationship to Sluggo becomes uh, the crucial storyline of this section of the book. Yeah, why is that door open? Did we shut that door first? I think we're running a little bit tight on time, okay. and I'm conscious of the fact right, that we... Well, I'll just finish up. Yeah. This is, this is yeah. about the last 20-some-odd pages of the book. Yeah. So um, it's, it's revealed that Nancy is Nancy's a real person, <laughs> Sluggo was a real person. They had a unacknowledged love affair for many years, and then Sluggo left her, and she's, she's been heartbroken ever since. Mm -hmm. She's kind of toughing it out, but underneath, she's heartbroken. And so I give them a, a reunion at the end, in which we find that Sluggo is on Instagram, <laughs> and he's, he's an old man, and he has a, a three-foot white beard. And so then I go interview Sluggo, and I suggest, he says, how, how is Nancy doing? And that's the, that's the kind of the, the trigger for Sluggo and Nancy to actually get back together at the end. And when they get back together, they're no longer old. They go into their individual beds, and they say goodnight to each other, and they're children again. Yeah. So <laughs> then, then the book ended for me. It's the, it's the perfect ending, though. <laughs> Now, we could talk for another hour, uh, not only about Bushmiller, but also about your other book, which I would, we haven't had time to cover, which is The Buildings Do we have time Barking. for questions? Or? I think we have time for Q&A. Would you like to, uh, just about, anyone? Uh, no, we don't. We anybody have to cut it there. But uh, you'll be signing your book, of course, I, I imagine, on the, on the, uh, the, the special SBX table. Yep. Uh, and, the new, the, and the other comic comes from Fantagraphics Underground, and it is the most beautiful tribute to your late wife, uh, Diane Newman. Yeah, um, and and we, there is much to talk about in that, but I would recommend it very highly. It's an equally really powerful work. So, if just a couple of quick questions we could do. If I think, but we, I've been given a kind of cut off. Are we are we out of time? This is we have a crowd waiting to get into the well, next one. I think. We all go. We're out actually, of, at three. We all go a little bit over. Yeah, yeah, we do. So you want to? Anyone got a burning question? Yeah. Have someone down here, please. Go ahead. I just one. I've heard you say that Robert Crumb is one of the contemporaries who does not get Nancy. Oh yes. Well. Hey, no, he, he, yeah. Yes. yeah, you're right that he doesn't get Nancy, but that doesn't mean he doesn't like Nancy. He does like Nancy. He just doesn't get it in the way that I do. So I have to explain it to him. <laughs> I, I haven't used the Charlie Chaplin Buster Keaton analogy yet with him, but I'm planning on it. Yeah. <laughs> because he, he would completely understand that analogy. Um, that could be the one that could make him appreciate it, in my impact, couldn't it? Yeah. yeah it could um, work. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have to say something about Robert Crumb. Yes. Without Robert Crumb, we wouldn't be here. Okay? Robert Crumb is the 800 pound cartoonist in the room, always. <laughs> I was just at the National Cartoonist Society getting the Rubin Award. If Robert Crumb entered that space, he would neutralize everyone there. They would all be gone. Because they would never give him a Rubin Award in a million years. He's too, he's, he's too good. He's the best cartoonist that's ever been, there has ever been, living or dead, in my opinion. Only two works of comics give me complete pleasure when I read them. My criti critical mind turns off. That's Nancy and Robert Crumb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, and have we just got a very quick moment? I want just one moment, the story of what happened when Crumb came to visit you and subsequently because as you know, Robert Crumb lost Aileen Kaminsky at around, all around the same time. How have you, two days you after, bonded? Two days after Aileen, Aileen died, yes. which is about two months after Diane died, hmm. Robert called me and he was very matter of fact and calm, which I thought was odd. He doesn't usually call me, usually we write, we have correspondence, actual letters, you know? Yeah. He wanted to know in great detail since it had been two months since 
since Diana died, he wanted to know what to expect. What was the grieving process like? So I told him. As soon as I told him, he started bawling his eyes out. He started crying. Until that time, he wasn't able to feel that kind of loss. And we've talked about it since then. And he's helped you when he visited you recently to also deal with your grief. He, yeah, Robert, I don't know if you're aware, Robert took a tour of the United States. It lasted about four months. He's back home in France. Um, so he came to, to stay with me for a while. And he's not coming back, coming back to America, is he? He's not coming back to America, Crum. No, I, I asked him because I, I would love it if he did. <laughs> um, but I said, are you, now that Aileen is gone, mm. does that change your idea? Are you going to stay in, in Sove, in this little medieval village where he lives? Mm. And he said, why would I leave? I have six women who take care of me. He has a secretary. He has a cook. I mean, not literally every meal, but a cook lives next door. He has a series. That they all, he said they all just happen to be women. But they are his support group. Yeah. He would have to duplicate that somehow by moving back to wherever. Mm. And why would he bother them? You know, it took, a, it took 30 years to get this support system mm. working. Mm. Why would he suddenly uh, abandon it? Yeah, OK. He still, to this day, cannot really speak French. <laughs> so, yeah. He speaks enough to go to the post office and to go look for 78 records. So the essentials. Yeah, he the knows essentials. the essentials. Yeah. Bill. He, can, he can bargain with the, the 78 record people. Yeah. Very good. A round of applause for Bill Griffith, please. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much.